Okay, we're back at Cromwell Park here in Shoreline. We still have water behind us, and we've got water up above. We're sitting in this kind of nice dry gazebo. With, uh, a, with a wetland behind wetland us. Wetland behind protected, us. Protected mm -hmm. wetland. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at a nested conditional proof this time, where you might make more than one assumption. Yeah. And that can be, it'll be needed for some proofs, and then sometimes it just makes the proof easier. It may not be needed, but it's the easiest way to do it. So we want to see how it can work. Now, now some teachers don't cover nested proofs, and some do. So a nested conditional proof is a conditional proof that has within it a, a proof, uh, an indented proof. So it's an indented proof within an indented proof. Some teachers don't go that far, some do. What makes you think this, when you look at this conclusion mark, what makes you think it's going to be a, require a nested proof? Well, this is what I would be thinking. Uh, I don't know what to do with the premise, so I'd be looking at the conclusion first. I see that this is the main operator, the main connector, so, so we've got a conditional, mm -hmm. which is making me think use conditional proof, because uh -huh. my goal is conditional. I like using conditional proof. Yeah. What I would assume would be F, mm -hmm. the antecedent. Then I'd be looking for the consequent. That's the way conditional proof works. But now that I look at this, at this point, that would be my goal, G horse U H. That too is a conditional, so I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I'll make a second assumption, assume the antecedent of my present goal, and then try to find H. And as I see that, so I'd end up assuming F, and assume G. I can see right here, I've got some really easy things to do right afterwards. Yeah. So yeah. this problem's super easy if I'm bold enough to make some assumptions. Uh huh. So this horseshoe tells you it's going to be a con probably a conditional, and then when you see that you got to get this, that horse you suggest another, another conditional yeah. within the conditional. Yeah. So let's start off okay. with the indenting, All right. and I'll assume F, the antecedent of my entire goal. Okay, we're going to assume F, the antecedent, okay. because conditional proof says if you assume, if you want to reach, if you want to prove a formula of the form P horseshoe Q, you assume the P, reach the Q then you can assert the entire P horseshoe Q. So we've assumed the P, now we have to reach the Q, the G horseshoe H. Which is another conditional. It's another conditional. So at this point, what I'll do is indent a second time, do another conditional proof, make another assumption. I'm going to assume the antecedent of my goal. Yeah. And then afterwards, try to find H. So Good. let's assume G at this point. So now I'll indent within the indentation. So now I'm doing an indented proof within an indented proof. So I'll indent and assume G by assumed premise. Because the rule for conditional proof says that anywhere in a proof you can indent yeah. and assume an antecedent. It doesn't restrict you from, from doing it again if you've already done it. And that would be line three. Okay. At this point, now that I've assumed G, the antecedent of my present goal, at this point I'm now looking for an H. And I really don't need to make any more assumptions because there's a lot of really easy things to do. One thing I can do is a modus ponens with lines one and three. That would get me F horseshoe H. Okay, you want to do so that? This line four would be F horseshoe H. Okay, so P, P horseshoe Q, Mark's bringing down the Q. And I'm still in the sequence at this point. And he's still in this indentation. That was modus ponens? Uh, one and three. One and three. Okay. I'll make it like a fraction, is all right. that all right? All right. Okay. Okay. Again, I'm looking for an H at this point. At this very moment, my goal is H, and I can get it with another modus ponens on line two and four. So how does that line five be H? Still in this indentation. Yeah. And that's going to be two, or modus ponens, two and four. Two and four. Again, it's like okay. a fraction, okay. not usually supposed to be that way, but we don't have room. And so, Mark, you keep, you're keeping your eye on the goal, yeah. aren't you? That's what guides you. So I was looking for an H. I got it. So when I assume G, I was looking for an H, I can now pull out one column to the left, and I can write, if G's true, then H must be. So now I'm in this column. So now we're going to drop out to this column and discharge our assumption and write, if G, then H, by CP. CP uh, three, through three, five. Okay, three, three, four, five. And that would be line six. And that was line six. Now it's important to remember when you do a nested proof, that you have to close off the inner proof before you do the outer proof. And I would not really be able to use lines three, four, or five individually after this because they're locked off. But that's I can a, use one, to two, or six at this point. That's right. Once you've discharged an assumption and disindented and drawn the inference, you cannot appeal to these lines if you go further. So these are out of the proof now. They're out of play. And just remember, you have to, if you start an indented proof within an indented proof, you have to close off the inner proof 
before you close off the outer proof. <coughs> so, uh, okay. when I assumed F, the antecedent of my big goal, I was looking for G horseshoe H, and I got it. So if this is true, it looks like this must be. Given that these, given yeah, that this given is that. true. <coughs> so for line seven, I'm going to discharge once again and say if F is true, then G horseshoe H is true over there. Okay. Now we see P two through six, including all of this. Good. See yeah. two through six. So in other words, given two through six, assuming this is true, this must be true. So the justification appeals to all the lines that were indented to get to this. Sweet. And so, very good, Mark. A nice nested CP. And I, I want to uh, make one quick point. I meant to make it at the end of the last video. There's a common error that people sometimes make. It's easy to get mixed up when you're working with lots of symbols. And you'll remember this, Mark. A lot of people, when they're doing a conditional proof, this. <clears throat> I'm going to make a little model here. There, um, thank you. They're doing a conditional proof, blah, blah, blah. They've got to get, you know, A horseshoe B. And so they assume A is their assumed premise, and they're trying to reach what? B. Trying to reach B. And they get going. And then they get mixed up and they forget, and they try to derive a horseshoe B down here at the bottom of their indentation instead of just B. And that's a mistake. What's say, the mistake? Well, what they're looking for, what their goal is actually B, if they ended up getting a horseshoe B, they don't know that a horseshoe B is true. Right. It's all based on this assumption. Right. What they need to do is get the B so they can use CP to pull back out and with confidence say A horseshoe B. Right. So when you're doing a conditional proof for P horseshoe Q and you reach, uh, your goal at the bottom of the indentation is not to reach the conditional. It's only to reach the consequent of the conditional, the B alone. I tell my students to kind of chant like, chant like a mantra, go home, do some yoga, assume the antecedent, try to find the consequent. Assume the antecedent, try to find the consequent. And then assert the conditional. Yeah, I just, like you're trying to find the, assume the antecedent, and trying to find the consequent, and then you'll get the conditional after that. So the chant could be assume the antecedent, try to get the consequent, assert the conditional if you do. Would that be a that good chant? That could work. You know, it's almost a ditty at that point. A ditty. Well, they could chant a ditty. You could make it like a sea chanty. I, I could do that. <laughs> but in the Middle Ages, the a monks... A sea fee chanty. <laughs> A CP chanty, good, yeah. good one. Yes. In the Middle Ages, the monks would have uh, little rhyming uh, mnemonic devices that they would chant to, to remember their little logic rules. So there'd be a rule put into a chant, and then they'd chant it. Mm -hmm. Early minute. rap. Early, maybe. Very good. Monk rap. Monk rap. Like an early form of rap. Monk, yeah. Medieval monk rap. Mm -hmm. So um, just remember that when you're trying to reach B. Uh, when you assume A and re trying to reach B, only a, only reach B. Don't try to get the whole conditional at the bottom. So that's the lesson. We hope this is helpful. We do.